More than 6.3 million hectares of Australian bush, forest and national park have burned in what's being called the worst wildfires in the country's history. The megafires have claimed the lives of 24 people, including three volunteer firefighters, over half a billion animals, and killed off the chances of Prime Minister Scott Morrison of ever looking like a decent human being again in his natural living day. Nah, you're an idiot, mate. Oh. You really are. Forget about that whole global warming malarkey for a second. The Deputy Prime Minister suggested that exploding horse manure was behind the devastating wildfires. While respected journalists like Donald Trump's large adult fail son, Donald Trump Jr., have touted the theory that nefarious arsonists are to blame for the catastrophe. Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, the largest media corporation in Australia responsible for 58% of the country's newspaper circulation, has been at the heart of a disinformation campaign. It's been claimed that the fires which have burned more of New South Wales than the previous 15 years of bushfires combined are nothing to be worried about and are no worse than the marshmallow melters of the past. And all the while, conspiracy theories on WhatsApp and Facebook have flourished, pinning the blame on greenies for blocking prescribed burning, which is A, bollocks, and B, bollocks. Oh, and maybe Muslims are behind it all anyway. There's big money to be made by watching the world burn. Some men just want to watch the world burn. The five biggest publicly owned oil and gas companies spent over $200 million last year lobbying to block, control, delay and derail climate policy. In the US alone, fossil fuel interests have outspent environmental groups in lobbying by a ratio of 10 to 1. And Australia is not much different. Despite being one of the most vulnerable developed countries to climate change, as the world's largest exporter of coal and liquefied gas, successive governments have worked tirelessly to water down international climate agreements that might have otherwise interfered with the fossil fuel industry. While its domestic emissions are fairly low, those from Australia's carbon exports are among the world's largest. The beleaguered PM Scott Morrison, who tragically had to cut his Christmas holly bobs in Hawaii short because, like, his country was on fire, literally owes his entire premiership to fossil fuel money. Clive Palmer, a coal mining magnate, set up a political party which delivered Scott Morrison's Liberals a narrow election win last year by peeling voters away from Labour. Despite not winning a single seat, Palmer's $53.6 million blitz was far from a waste of money. Shortly after the federal elections, Palmer announced the construction of the largest coal mine in Australia. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasure. be scared. It's coal. 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 Fossil fuel billionaires, a government of reactionaries and the omnipresence of the Murdoch media machine. So far, so familiar. But there's something deeper at play here too. A colonial dimension to climate denialism. From Bolsonaro in Brazil to Trump in America, the world's leaders in aggressive climate denial tie together the auctioning of land to loggers, frackers and miners to nativist ideas around who belongs on the land in the first place. When you think about it, this is just settler colonialism, the dispossession and eradication of people considered racially inferior in order to pursue ecologically suicidal forms of economic activity on conquered land. The idea of terra nullius, nobody's land, was a potent one in the colonisation of Australia. The continent, right up until a landmark 1992 court ruling, was considered to have been desert and uncultivated before European settlement. But, of course, Australia wasn't desert and uncultivated. It had been home to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples for 65,000 years before Europeans got there. What they meant was that the land hadn't been cultivated in line with European norms, with the right to exploit natural resources codified by written property rights. Demonstrations of the settlers' mastery over the land, the clearing of the big scrub in New South Wales, or the felling of forests, was a celebrated part of the Australian national story. The extraction and exhaustion of natural resources wasn't a risk to the civilising mission, it was the embodiment of it. In Capitalist Realism, Mark Fisher argued that eco-catastrophe demands a collective political subjectivity which simply doesn't exist yet. It's too impersonal, responsibility too diffuse, and the demand for collective action contrasts too sharply with the neoliberal values of individualism and growth at all costs. Drill, baby, drill, and drill now. 
But what I'd add to that is that the origins of climate denialism can be found in settler colonialism. The idea that there are no limits to the plunder of land, resources and people stretches back a lot further than oil wars and the Koch brothers. Ecological collapse is coded into our definition of what makes a civilised society. And the upshot is that in the 21st century, we've ended up living in the literal manifestation of the this is fine meme.